Hi everyone, Timothy Jordan here for one last interview. This one with Francoise, uh, Principal Scientist here at Google. Hi Timothy. <laughs> How are you? Very good, and you? I'm doing so good. The festival has been amazing, and we've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of people about what they do, mm -hmm. and that's why I'm excited for this moment here, because you do some really cool stuff. All right, yeah, it is cool, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, why don't we give everybody just an introduction to the work that you do around machine learning and input? Yeah, so I work on speech recognition and I work on keyboard input. So speech recognition, you all know what it's about. Uh, Sandar has been talking about our progress in voice and you know how we've lowered our word error rate quite a bit, uh, Google Home and all that. Uh, and uh, I've been working on speech for the last 12 years at Google. And then more recently, maybe last two, three years, I've been working on keyboard input. And, um, you know, when people think of their keyboard, they think it's something very simple where they just take the, the mobile keyboard on their phone and they just tap, you know, the letters of what they want to spell. But in reality, if you want a good keyboard that really understands you and corrects your mistakes and predicts the next word that you're going to type, uh, it's pretty complicated. And there's a lot of machine learning that goes into keyboard as well. Yeah, that's one of the things when you were I were talking about this earlier yeah. is that that's a common misconception that like right. machine learning wouldn't apply to the keyboard because you're just hitting buttons, but that's actually not true at all. No, it's not true at all. <laughs> uh, and um, you know, keyboard is very interesting because it's such um, a complex product in itself because you can do a lot of things with a keyboard. You can tap on the keys, you can swipe what you want to, to write, and then uh, you can even click on the microphone and then you can speak to your keyboard too, all right? So the two modalities come together there. Uh, but doing a good job at correcting your typos, yet letting you type new words that the keyboard maybe doesn't know about and then learn those words and those phrases for you, and then uh, being able to predict the next word or the next phrases that you're going to type so that you don't have to type them. You can just say, oh yeah, that's what I meant, click. Uh, that's, that takes a lot of machine learning. Yeah. Awesome. You know, one of the other aspects of your work that I find really interesting is I end up talking to a lot of machine learning researchers mm -hmm. that are just blazing new ground. It's really right. interesting, but it's like very theory yeah. and theoretical. But what right. you do is you have problems and you've just found that machine learning is a good way to solve right. them. Right. So the, the way that I like to think about these problems is I have a technology to build, right? And it has many facets and there are many things that we need to optimize. It can be the machine learning, it could be the UI, it could be the infrastructure that's behind it that nobody sees. And so what we're really trying to do is to understand the pinpoints for the user. Where are the places where our users are wasting time, are getting frustrated? What are the places that they enjoy instead? And then trying to understand those problems, then we look at what are the right solutions for those problems. And sometimes the solution is just, you know, sweeping a parameter. And sometimes it takes like a really complex piece of machine learning. So we're just picking the technology that matches the problem that we have to solve and we improve the technology one step at a time. It's yep. uh, really interesting to kind of have that perspective of it's very pragmatic about machine learning. Right, right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And uh, I, I think it's a good approach because once you know exactly what, the, the hardest part is really figuring out what is the problem that you're trying to solve. And I think a lot of developers are struggling exactly with that same problem. It's what is it that I'm trying to solve? How am I formalizing that? And then what is the best tool to solve that problem? Awesome. Yeah. So there's another aspect of your work I want to bring up. This is the last one, I promise, uh -huh. uh, which I find really interesting. And you call it deep internationalization. Can you tell me what that is? Yes. So, um, you know, as you may guess, I'm not a native US uh, American speaker. Uh, I grew up in Belgium. Belgium is a country with French and German and, and Flemish. Uh, I learned Italian when I came here to the United States. So I care deeply about languages. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have found uh, developing those keyboards that a lot of countries in the world and a lot of languages are not well represented in mobile keyboards. What I mean by that is that there are a lot of people in the world, sometimes tens of millions of people, who speak a language and would like to write to their friends in that language, but that language is not supported on a keyboard. 
So what do they do? Either they go back to another language, so maybe I cannot type in French, I would go back to English because it's okay, my friends understand English too. But that's not what I want to do. I want to speak French with my family. And if, I, if we happen to speak a much you know, more distant language that is not well represented, we wouldn't have the luxury of being able to talk to each other in our own language. So that brings us into the space where we think it's not just about bringing a few tens of languages into our keyboards and into Google technology in general. It's about hundreds of languages. It's about going beyond a thousand languages. There are in the world 1,342 languages, according to linguists, that have more than 100,000 speakers. So you imagine, and if you go into even the deeper end, it would be in the 6,000, 7,000 languages. And so I really have a passion for bringing as many of those languages online as possible and progressively enabling technologies like speech recognition, keyboard input to more and more languages. And the way you design an app is just a little bit different if you're trying to design for all of them, right? Yeah, so the app itself, we try to keep things as general as possible mm -hmm. because there's no way you can scale to hundreds of languages if your infrastructure is not general and your modeling uh, methodologies are not you know, as general and scalable as possible. And that's where machine learning actually is very helpful to us. Because before we had machine learning to solve our problems, we would really hard code things. And you would see pieces of C++ code that would say, if language equal German, do this, right? And that's, that's not what you want. There is no way to scale that. With machine learning, you essentially have the algorithms that are data independent and language independent, mm -hmm. and then the data is the piece that contains the knowledge about the language. So now there's this nice interface between algorithmic work and data work. And so once you have the right algorithms, it's just a question of pumping data from different languages into them <laughs> to create a new capability in those languages. And if you improve your algorithms, all the languages improve at the same time. So it's a really nice synergy as long as you can establish that boundary. Mm. And with machine learning, that's very easy to do. Yeah, and it sounds, it sounds very sort of, once you get the right perspective, exactly. things start to fall into place. Exactly, you really want to build from, this, from scratch with this thinking of how am I going to internationalize my product, my technology, but not just to five languages, just to hundreds of languages. Okay. Yeah. So I think that's about all the time that we have, but thank right. you so much for joining with me and talking about all this. Yeah. Is there anything else, I'd say, if you could see some developers on the other end of this camera that would love to be doing the kind of work that you're doing now, what's some of the stuff that you'd tell them to get started on? Um, you know, I think the, the, the best work that you do is really when you're passionate about the thing that you're doing. Mm. So I would think for each developer, if they are, and I assume they are passionate about what it is that they're trying to develop, dig deep into it. Just don't be satisfied with something that's average quality. Keep digging and digging to try to understand your product the best you can and what your users want the best you can and then keep developing from there and everything will go well. Awesome. Francoise, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you.